Hello to all of the gardeners. We're glad that you've joined us and welcome to Mid-American Gardener. It's gonna be a great show and we're gonna talk about what's happening right now. Hi, I'm Diane Nolan and I teach horticulture at the University of Illinois in the Crop Sciences Department in the College of Aces. And so I'll handle cut flower questions and maybe a little bit of perennials, but I know there's a lot of information in, and knowledge at this table. So we're gonna find out who's here and you can direct your questions that way. Let's start first with Mark Kemp. Hi, Mark. Hello, as she said, my name's Mark Kemp. I'm a landscape architect and I can answer questions, trees, shrubs, perennials, or just general landscape design, so. Very good. Um, I have a question here from a viewer about ginkgo trees, and it kind of applies to all other trees or shrubs as well. Um, ginkgo trees usually turn gor gorgeous golden in the fall, but this year I've seen several where most of the leaves have fallen and they're still green. What's happening? Well, a lot of times a tree will just kind of show you the symptoms. They're just kind of like you and I, that they're showing you a symptom of a drought time or drought period. Um, so in this case, most likely it was probably after a summer of drought, and so it was shedding some of its leaves to kind of weather that um, lack of moisture. Um, or it could be other stresses as well, but it's just kind of a symptom, and it's just a tree's way to kind of adapt to that. So usually no concern. Um, they're very adaptable, um, but if it's so severe, you know, you could uh, help it along with, uh, you know, in a drought situation, keeping the stress away, watering on a regular basis, or you know, kind of going that way. And there's always mulch. Yes. Yep. Conserving the moisture, but in you know, it's just kind of a, a sign that things are changing. And there's been a few environmental stresses here in the last couple of yes. years. Yes. So could be temperature change too. It's That's something true. something dramatic that caused the tree to kind of change its normal pattern. Okay. Thank you, Mark. And now let's throw it over to Kay Carnes in the middle. Hi, I'm Kay Carnes. I'm a Champaign County Master Gardener. <clears throat> My areas of expertise are vegetables, especially heirloom vegetables, herbs, uh, seed saving, and some perennials. And I have a, a question here from a viewer or comment. He says, I'm a first time gardener and I would like to start, I would like to plant a few vegetables. What vegetables do you think would be, I would be most successful with? And there's a lot of vegetables that I think would work really well starting in the spring, or it's a little late now, but you might think about a fall crop or things like radishes mm -hmm. and lettuce and spinach. You know, the salad greens, they're always pretty easy. Onions are, do well. Um, this time of year, a real great crop is green beans, um, especially bush beans. Uh, tomatoes and peppers are all, all good choices. So um, <clears throat> I would recommend that you start small with just a few plants or a few varieties. Um, I think one mistake a lot of new gardeners make is they want to grow everything and they do too much and then they get overwhelmed by it. Another thing I would encourage you to do is to educate yourself. Um, starting with the seed packet, there's always a lot of really good information on how to plant the seed, how to space the seeds, uh, how deep to plant them, and things like that. Um, of course, there's a lot of things online. I, I really recommend like university extension offices. Uh, the U of I has a lot of good information. Cornell University has a lot of good fruit. Uh, most of the university ag departments will have really good. And finally, watch our show. <laughs> That's right. Very good. <laughs> That's really good that someone's preparing themselves like that uh -huh. for what crops. Yeah. But. The, I think some of the spring ones are great. It's just soil moisture that sometimes. Exactly. Yeah. And of course, there's tomatoes, but things can happen. Yes. <laughs> to tomatoes. But thank you, Kay. That was a good primer on vegetables starting out. Well, we're going to go next to Rusty Molding, right to my left. Hi, Rusty. Hi, Diane. Thanks for having me on the show. I appreciate the opportunity. You're welcome. Yeah. So uh, uh, my wife and I, uh, Corey, own a small landscape company up out of Watsika. We're landscape contractors. Uh, specialize in design, build, and maintain. Uh, and today, I've got a show and tell to start with. So um, there's some pictures of, um, of some plants, and every gardener has experienced this, and this time of year is when it starts to be a little bit more obvious that something's amiss in your shrub border. If you'll take a look at this picture, what you'll notice is um, there is a, a larger shrub, and it's sort of impacted in the middle of another shrub. The, the ornamental is, is actually kind of covered up. 
So um, first things first, find the right pair of tools. Uh, this is a nice pair of loppers, good for cutting down branches, uh, say roughly an um, uh, inch and a half and smaller. Um, nice thing about this pair of loppers is, this is a neat party trick, the handles extend. That's, that's worth it right there. Um, I moved back. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that is, that is a nice feature, so when you have to go in and cut them out. But identify what, what, the, uh, what the plant is, and then um, you have to kind of go in and cut it back. So to get everything in order, I also recommend you have an, an herbicide ready. 41% um, glyphosate is an excellent uh, uh, product to use uh, in this system, but you go back in, you cut the plant back down very, very short, the, the weed tree, if you will, the honeysuckle, the um, uh, tree of heaven, uh, and, and of course the famous mulberry. You get it cut back very close to the ground, and then you paint around that outside circle uh, the cambial layer with that 41% glyphosate. Read and follow label directions, of course, but by doing so, the tree won't come back, and that's the idea. That is a very good tip because a lot of people want to know and they just want to spray it. But you, you save so much sure. by just that little bit of application. Well, and you, you get it done and it's out of there and you don't have to cut it again. You don't have to watch it. <laughs> you don't have for, to watch. For years on end, right? Yeah, <laughs> slow death and everyone enjoying that. No, not enjoying that. Thank you very much. That's a good thing. There's always something to prune. I was pruning um, actually today and yesterday. One thing about heat I've noticed, and then we're going to go to some more emails, you get things done really fast. You don't <laughs> hang around. You know, you just get it done. You decide what you're going to do. It's too warm. You get in there, get it done, and then take a water break. Well, we don't have any phone calls, so we're hoping to encourage some of you to call in with that. And in the meantime, let's go to a special Did You Know? <music> carrots is only orange but oh. I like growing the rainbow color mm -hmm. ones they're a lot of fun one that's cosmic purple and uh -huh. it's a lot of fun Drag is it a well, dragon's blood or something like yes uh-huh I think there's quite a few really fun ones and they all taste good just prepare your soil deeply mm -hmm. and don't harvest them really really long and big I like them quicker all right let's go back to show and tells while we're waiting or uh, emails while we're waiting for some phone calls okay mark you're next i have a email from a viewer uh, in the chicago area r hale um, writes uh, that she's she's curious on evergreen choice or something for winter interest that would survive um, a chicago winter um, i think many times people kind of focus just on green and there's varying colors of green uh, evergreen wise you could go with like a false cypress uh, you can get a lot of yellow greens out of that um, boxwood would be a hardy plant that's a common plant that you'll find um, then you could go dark green with uh, a holly um, and the holly then would introduce a berry as well uh, arborvitae would also give you yellow greens to a varying uh, just a straight green but you can also mix in other plants that have like a bark interest um, it might be a red stem dogwood, or it might be a, a bark that peels. Um, so you can kind of play that way. And then you can also introduce a perennial that kind of, I, I like to say, like, like a sedum. An autumn joy sedum stands up tall, and if you leave the head on it, then it'll, it'll hold snow, and it's that brown, tan color mixed in with an evergreen next to it, and you'll get you know, two interests throughout that season. So you play, play them against each other, and I think you can have, have a wide variety of interest. You're making me think of paper bark maple. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> paper, bark, paper bark maple is one of the best. I mean, it just, it just peels off and then that, that deep maroon color it's and that tan. Beautiful. Yeah. Yep. Well, we're going to go back to emails in just a moment, but we have some phone uh, calls. Yeah, so let's excellent. go to those next. And we'll start with line one. And Jane has a question for us about Siberian iris. Hi, Jane. Hi. Um, thanks for taking my call. You're um, welcome. I'm calling in regard to the fact that we're having trouble getting blooms on our Siberian iris. We have them planted in a spot that has a lot of shade, but it gets 
morning sun for about five hours, and then we also have them planted in a sunny area. And the interesting thing is when we give them to friends, they prosper in their yard. But in our yard, there we've had very few, few blooms this year. The one concern I have is do we need to amend the soil and also could rabbits be um, affecting whether we get blooms because we do have rabbits that love to make holes in that area. <clears throat> okay, so I'll throw it out to the whole panel. <laughs> what do you think? <laughs> Go ahead. Siberian iris. Um, <laughs> Uh, the shade is probably a little bit of an issue mm -hmm. for you. Mm -hmm. uh, that's probably your biggest culprit. So if anything you can do to try to get those moved to a sunnier location is going to improve your chances of receiving uh, a better floral display. Um, I think first and foremost, that's where I'd start. Because when you give, she gave it to other people, they did just fine. So mm -hmm. makes me wonder, sun, and maybe they need to be divided. I don't right, know I was going to add could that be. too. Mm -hmm. Uh, well, a lot of times a plant will kind of just kind of lose its energy a little bit and when you give some to their friends you're kind of you're you're opening that up and it gets a chance to renew itself and if you do the same thing to your own bed itself you know you'll you'll see similar results but other factors like the shade is, are playing a role and yeah. I have mine on the south side of our garage it's full sun all day long and they they do best there than any other spot I've put them I know oh I always like to encourage the flowering by cutting them back mm -hmm. and so now this winter i didn't get to it but the snow just <laughs> mounded the so it. Yeah, <laughs> it for it down <laughs> and it didn't need to be but a lot of times when they stand up and they make a nice winter mm -hmm. character um, i will cut them back now i know that they work well because i got half of them done one time and i got sidetracked and so i had really good flowers where i had cut them back and the very you know, half of the clump, I had not cut them back, and they have to fight to get through. So you might want to think about cutting back, more shade, dividing, you know, south side. And I would also add that you could rule out the rabbit. I mean, rabbit damage yes, is going to be very you. obvious. Um, it's and going they're to so be, tall. You know, I've a, never had It's going to be severed, either. and you're going to see the actual injury. So it's not like a mystery. Yeah, I, I'm glad you said that because it's not, it's not rabbits. Okay, thank you very much, Jane. And let's go on to line two, and Sherry has a question for us about pecans. Hi, Sherry. Hi. What's your question? Um, I were wanting to plant some pecan trees in central Illinois, and can you tell me if there's a better or worse variety? Oh, wow. Do you know, Rusty? <laughs> well, actually, um, I did some research on this. Um, uh, pecans actually like it moist. Um, they, it's a carrier, and they do well in moist areas. Um, uh, but I don't believe that there are, well. I think there are some <laughs> hardy, hardy varieties that will survive. They might not survive a winter like last year, but that's yeah. true. <coughs> you know, it's yeah, it's probably not necessarily hardy for our area, mm -hmm. but it's hardy compared to each other. So. Mm -hmm. I found one source for <laughs> for a pecan tree um, here about two years ago, so it's it's kind of a challenging plant to find. I'd say look look at your local garden center, um, ask them to help in your procuring the plant, uh, and they can also help guide you uh, to different uh, selections if they are available in the trade. That's kind of your biggest challenge. Yeah. So unless we come up with something, but your research will probably do just as well because we would be doing the same research mm -hmm. for what is the hardiest. And we are at the northern we part are, yeah. we are. of it's what's hard. It's, it's a great native tree, though. Yeah, it is. Fantastic. If you can find the right spot in a moist area. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, thank you, Sherry. We were a little bit vague, but we don't want to give you a name, <laughs> and that may not be the best one for you. Okay, let's go to line three, and Lynn has an ornamental pear question. Hello, Lynn. Hello. I enjoy your program so much, and I appreciate your taking my call. You're welcome. Last year, a terrible drought year, I noticed that there were some brown leaves toward the top of my ornamental pear tree. And this year, the tree is just full of these dark brown leaves, a lot of green leaves, and it seems to be living. But I'm wondering what I should do about this. I have two ornamental pear trees, mm -hmm. and the other one is just now beginning to show the same problem. 
and I don't know what to do. I don't know okay. if there's something I can do to save the tree or... This is an what epidemic this year. Yeah, it is. Yeah. It is. Uh, I'm going to just jump in and say fire blight, yeah. and then yep. <laughs> if you want to comment on what you do about it, you guys jump in, but it's definitely fire blight. Uh, fire blight, to control fire blight, um, probably the, if you don't have much damage, uh, an easy way to do it is um, fire blight actually forms a, a shepherd's crook, so mm -hmm. the end of it will kind of tip over, and then it dies back down the stem six, eight inches, uh, sometimes further. Go at least six, eight inches below that, and you can cut it out if you have minimal damage. Um, if you have a bigger tree, you're probably looking at, uh, and you want to save it or at least improve its health, you're probably looking at contacting um, a professional um, applicator to spray the tree with some sort of copper-related uh, compound, and, and that will also help protect the tree. And doesn't that have to be done at a certain, like when the flower, it's when it's just starting to very, flower? Very, very critical periods of time. Mm -hmm. the and the homeowner can't do it. Yeah. So, one other thing about cutting, um, it really needs to be cleanliness. And so I always jump in and say, you really have to yeah. almost after every cut. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. Lysol. Or yeah, you Clorox spread it. Dip. Yeah, just don't spread it by <laughs> trying to take it out. But this is an epidemic this yeah, year because yeah. we've had a moist spring. And, and last spring was too. And that's true. So yeah. it's double. Yeah. Wow. Okay, well, we're sorry to hear about that, Lynn, but thank you for your question. Let's do one more, and we're going to go to a line four with Kathy about her iris. Hi, Kathy. Hi, thank you for taking my call, and I, like the other lady, really enjoy your show. Thank you. Uh, I've, I've had a bed of irises for several years, they've been established. And this year they didn't come up, and there was a mole in the area. And I'm wondering if moles could eat what I call the roots of the iris. You had no, they're rhizomes. You had nothing? It just. No, but, uh, well, I didn't dig down. I don't think there was. I did in one area, there wasn't. And I wondered maybe if they froze out with the cold winter. Uh, they've been there at least uh, four to five years. I so have, they had been there. <laughs> have you ever heard of mold damage with irises? No. No. Uh -uh. I haven't. I f there's, a, there's a borer that will get into the tubers of iris. Yeah. But, but you but usually not. see, but you can yeah, see you it. The, right. the tubers left. Right. And you know. irises are just the toughest thing. They I mean, are. they are hardy to many zones mm -hmm. north, so it wouldn't be the winter. I thought you were going to say they were actually molding or that bacterial yeah. soft yeah. rot. Right. But yeah, the best thing to do would be to dig some up and kind of see what they look like, see if there is boreholes. Yeah. Um, well, ideally, or, they shouldn't be that deep. Right. <coughs> planted that deep no, anyway. You should see you should the rhizome should be top on the, the soil and mm -hmm. the roots are down in the yeah. soil. So if they were deep and you had to go for it, that may be why mm -hmm. you don't find them. Could be. They may have rotted. I don't know. Yeah. But yeah. Could be. Go for a treasure hunt. We had a wet, snow-covered winter. Yeah, that could be it. And then if you do find some, replant them with the rhizome on top, you know, let the roots get in there and cut it back about four or five inches to a fan so that it doesn't flop over and trim off any bad part of that rhizome or root um, and then try again and space them about six inches or even more. For long term, it could be a foot apart. It just looks ugly in the first couple of <laughs> years. Okay, well, we're going to take uh, and do a few emails, and then we'll come back to the phone lines. And Mark, since you did too, I'm going to skip right on over you <laughs> and go to Kay next. Okay, well, I have an email from Judy in Peoria, <clears throat> and she says that I've read that the flowers sold at the big box stores are genetically modified and, are, and contribute to the killing off of our bee population. Should we only grow plants from organic seeds? I don't want to be responsible for the demise of any bees. Um, you know, it, it, I would be careful about what I bought. I would, if you can get organic seeds, that's fine, but <clears throat> the old heirlooms um, or any open pollinated seed is, is just as well. Um, it doesn't necessarily have to be organic. Uh, most of the seed companies that do not at least the ones I deal with that don't uh, sell anything with genetic modification will state that in their catalogs, so you can just look through um, catalogs. 
The other thing you might try doing is uh, planting things that the bees love and promote your bee population. Um, you want to give them water in the form of maybe a bird bath or a pan in the, in the ground. Um, <clears throat> plant all kinds. There's a lot of plants that bees just love. Herbs, flowers, vegetables, even fruit trees. So um, just have a nice variety of plants in the yard. And um, you know, don't, don't use any insecticides unless you absolutely have to. And if you do, I would recommend using organic um, insecticides um, because that can really wipe out your bee population. Yeah. Okay, so. because there's a lot of factors that go on. It's not just one thing, exactly but it's a right. lot of things. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much for that, Kay. And now I think, Rusty, it's your turn. All right. Um, so we have a, an email that uh, talks about a young uh, pin oak tree that was purchased and um, it seems as though after it was planted, the, the top of it started angling uh, one direction and, and I suspect it, they, it was planted uh, maybe in, a, in an outlying area or maybe on a farm and that the wind sort of swept it over uh, and it sort of stayed in that direction. And the question was, can I, can I trim this? Can I cut it off? And um, first, I guess let me talk a little bit about trimming oak trees. Um, there is a, uh, a disease out there called oak wilt and it's transmitted by uh, sap feeding beetles, uh, picnic bugs, that sort of thing. And um, so generally speaking, you're not supposed to trim, you shouldn't trim <laughs> uh, oak trees from uh, basically the first of April around these parts uh, through about the end of October or after the first frost. That way the vector of that disease, which is a very, very significant and, and severe disease, will kill oak trees in a matter of a couple of months. Uh, that's not given the opportunity to be transmitted. Uh, as far as what to do about this particular situation, if, you, if it's still a young tree and you want to try to get a nice straight central leader out of your pin oak, uh, next spring before, you, um, uh, before the bud, buds break, take it back to whatever size you want it, tie a bamboo stake on, <laughs> and then you can cut it. Uh, and then as it starts to grow up, you just take some floral tape um, and then wrap around so that that leader stays nice and straight. And you can really see what to do at that stage because there's no leaves. Right, so absolutely. It works, it works out really well. And, and pin oaks do have a nice straight central leader, uh, whereas some of the others are much more varied and it doesn't matter yeah, as much. Yeah, that's true. Well, very good. That was a good uh, discussion on when to prune for oaks. Well, let's go to the um, mag quiz and it talks about evergreens. <music> could hear the panelists saying, I think it's you. And, <laughs> and the question was you, the answer was you. Now, I haven't seen it on there, but some years, bagworms get on everything. I saw bagworms on a stop sign one yeah. time. Yeah, oh. that's awesome. A couple years back, so, you know, it is interesting. <laughs> well, let's do a couple more phone lines, and we're gonna go to line six, and Joan has a question about tulip trees. Hi, Joan. Hello there. What's your uh, question? Okay, we have a um, tulip tree that's probably about 10 or 12 uh, years old. It's 30 or 40 uh, feet high. And this year, uh, the top about 8 or 10 feet of the tree is all green, uh, nice leaves, bloomed, the, you know, the nice uh, yellow-orange tulip blossoms. And then the next section of the tree going down for about, six, eight, or ten feet is uh, no leaves. It's all just the dead branches. They look like dead branches. Then the next section of the tree going down is all leafed out and uh, bloomed, had the nice yellow-orange blooms on it. And then the bottom part of the tree, uh, down closer to the ground, is uh, dead limbs with no leaves on them. It's, huh. it's the craziest-looking thing you've ever seen. Okay, so we have not much time left, but this sounds like an alternating <laughs> yeah. pattern. Is it, was it frost cold related? 
We're going to throw that out there for you. Now it Could will. The alternating part is confusing yeah. a little bit. Yeah. Could it be vascular? Maybe it's getting a girdled trunk or that's something that's. Might check. Yeah, at one of your the first things you'd look for is damage to the trunk, damage to a root system. Um, but it's not usually layered frost like would be that. At the it top. would be more, mm -hmm. yeah. right, you know, a section of the tree. Mm -hmm. So we are we are somewhat stumped on this alternating <laughs> green and dead <laughs> tulip tree. Now the middle part will probably get covered with leaves as it grows in, but it's going to be a little bit ugly in the meantime. Well, if we figure out anything else, we will certainly <laughs> come back to this question and see if we can get an answer uh, for another show. But I'm not sure. Yeah. It's a new one. I don't know. <laughs> well, thank you folks so much for watching. It goes so fast, and we appreciate it. Have a great week gardening. Goodbye.